Okay, I'm so excited about today's guest. I'm going to give you a little background. When I was a young green reporter, I met your husband, North Carolina's attorney general at the time, Mike Easley. He was always very kind to me. He had a great sense of humor. He was not intimidating. And I knew that he had a wife named Mary and a son named Michael. But it wasn't until he became governor in 2001 that we were all publicly introduced and you were the first lady at the time. You have many unique attributes. You were the first first lady to have a career outside of uh, being first lady, which I thought was really interesting. You were also the first Greek American first lady, one of the first Catholic first ladies, and you have done so many things to reinvent yourself over the years. Um, I'm just so pleased to have you here. Welcome to the program. Well, thanks, Amanda. So let's first of all talk about the biggest, most exciting thing that's happened in the last few years. <laughs> you are a grandmother. Tell me what that's been like, because I kind of look down the road at that and think, ooh, I'm going to apply for that job. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Michael and I have really enjoyed it. It is just, she is two years old now, and it is so much fun to watch her put things together and think and react to different experiences that we share with her. And um, it's been pretty wonderful. And yeah. she's two, her she's name two. is Meredith. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about being a grandparent that's different than being a parent? I know you, know, you hear a lot of different responses to that, but I'd like to hear you know, your thoughts on that. To a large degree, we are like Outback Steakhouse, you know, no wrong, just right. <laughs> and that is very freeing. And so um, I like to share, and Michael likes to share with her, experiences that make the little light bulb go off in her brain like, oh, Wow, wow, I can do this. Yeah, and you showed me a video a minute ago of her playing piano, uh, the electric keyboard, and then the background music coming in, and she got so excited and started dancing. And um, do you think you might have a musician on your hands? I don't know. You know what? She's a pretty good drummer, because I got her started on that from the time she was about six months old. So do I teach her? No. I encourage her at this point. So we're real big on art projects. We're big on, to me, cooking is my own chemistry lab. So we're big on chemistry. Oh, have in you the watched kitchen. Lessons in Chemistry? I've read the book. Okay, I've read the book <laughs> and watched it. The book was good. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the TV version was also good. Mm -hmm. You should check it out. Yeah. So I think what a lot of women who've worked in really intense careers have said to me about being a grandparent is that, you know, when you are raising your own children, you're so busy and you're so distracted and you have so many things going on. And the beauty about being a grandparent is you're, you're just completely focused on your, on your grandchild when you're with them. I mean, does it feel like that? Almost like a second chance in a way? Not like a second chance because um, with our son, Michael, he was folded into everything. If I didn't have any babysitting coverage and I had to go to court, when he came. I had my, oh yeah, he came. I drop him off at the jail, and the, as the, one does, as one does, and the jailer would kind of. It was this, you know, it was a rural community. I mean, it was not a real big city. Yeah. And the jailer would keep an eye on him, and I'd come back, and they probably took a mugshot of him or did play with the fingerprint pad. Or, and maybe that's how he ended up going the path that he did, right? I don't know, but. Also with campaigning, I mean, he was campaigning for my husband when he was still in diapers. So he was out there. Yeah, my dad was a district attorney in Pennsylvania, and I was campaigning in adolescence. And I remember going door to door. I had bumper stickers. I had pins. I was in, you know, the July 4th parade. So a lot of, lot of that for me as well. So go to work with your parents was not like an annual thing. It, it was, was like, like frequent. It was, it it was, was what yeah. you did. Um, so I know that um, you are an attorney. Talk to me about your career path and, and how it started and, and where you went with it. Uh, well, I grew up in New Jersey and uh, my father was an engineer, a chemical engineer, and then later he went to night school to become an architect. And he designed public buildings. My mother became an artist and was quite skilled. 
Now, we always had lots of interesting discussions <laughs> about public events, public service, um, politics, art, culture, at the dinner table, so every night we ate together. That sort of uh, created an environment of robust discussion. Not necessarily debate, but robust discussion among us, and they always treated us as adults. So, there's that. Then, uh, I watched a lot of Perry Mason. <laughs> okay. Who was a 19, that was a 1950s oh, yeah. television yeah. series with Raymond Burr. And it looked pretty cool. <laughs> and it looked like a lot of fun. Yeah. And I was already pretty much a very verbal child and uh, pretty dramatic. And um, when I was about 12, I decided that I probably wanted to be a lawyer. And so all the things that I did seemed to point you in that direction. That's exactly right. So uh, I kept picking up skills that might help me. Well, at the time, there weren't very many women lawyers. Yeah, I mean, when, what, when did you go to law school? I began law school in 1972. Yeah, so that was really unusual. Right. My mom went to law school in the late really? 70s, mm -hmm. um, but she already had multiple careers prior to that. But I was an adolescent. My brother was elementary school. It, it wasn't something women did, especially mothers. It was not something they did. Although there was somebody in my class who had three children. Which is pretty amazing that when you think amazing. about it back then. It was amazing. Yeah. So we ended up in about, I don't know, maybe there were 120 or some people in that class. I think about eight made it out. Eight women made it out. And... Um, I graduated in 75, which was a very rough employment year for everybody. Well, it was pretty rough for the women in the class. Absolutely. So hundreds of contacts were made by letter, by phone. Some were never even answered. Um, and I always thought I would be... I would be well satisfied being in the courtroom. So I began to look at assistant district attorney positions and I emailed all, I mean, didn't email them, we didn't have email, I wrote all of them. And I had a lot of interviews and got a lot of responses that had to do with I didn't have military experience. I was too small, I was five foot four. Huh, I, I can't wonder what that would have to do with anything. <laughs> I didn't have to wrestle them, I just had to talk them down. Exactly. So um, finally, I got an opportunity in Wilmington, North Carolina. Alan Cobb was my boss and he took a chance and hired me. And the trade-off was I went to a very rural place in 1975, which was Pender County, North Carolina in Burgaw. And they wanted a full-time assistant DA, and I was going to be it. Well, they weren't prepared for the fact that it was going to be me. Okay. <laughs> Not only was I a woman, but I was a New Jersey woman. So you were a formidable Plop. force. Well, I didn't go in there like a formidable force, I don't right. think. But I, I tell you, they really embraced me and took care of me. And that's great. Lots of times at night when I was trying cases in Wilmington, I'd have to drive back to my home in Pender County in Burgaw. And you know what? The Highway Patrol guys would follow me home to make sure I got home safe. That's pretty amazing. They didn't have to do that. Yeah, that's I didn't even amazing. know they were doing it. So. so tell me where you met your husband who became governor of North Carolina. Where did you guys meet? And did you bond on the law? I mean, was that a big part of it? <laughs> uh, my boss, Alan Cobb, kept introducing us and finally one time it took. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and from, it didn't take long. I mean, we were married, a year later we were married. How long have you been married? 44 years. Okay. Yeah. That's a lifetime, right? I know, I'm so crazy about him. Well, that's good. He's the most inventive person that I've ever met. One of my favorite things that you said when we were um, getting ready to do this in your bio, or one of your emails to me, is you said, I don't really have a bio because I don't need one anymore. And I thought about that so much in the last few weeks as I've been rewriting my bio over and over for a lot of the appearances that I'm doing. That's got to be a really freeing chapter in life when you know you've had this big career you've done so many things and now you're just like i'm going to do what i want to do talk about that transformation not just the actual transformation but kind of that that emotional and mental transformation going from go 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 all the time to really focusing on things that give you joy 
I've always done some things that gave me joy because I found those things renewing. Uh, but with the intensity of the kind of work we were doing from the time I was a prosecutor for 10 years to the time I had my own practice while I was pregnant, I opened the practice and within 90 days I was pregnant with Michael Jr. Uh, that lasted, that practice lasted nine or 10 years. And then when Michael en entered public life on a statewide scale, that changed the equation as well because that's at the point at which I entered teaching. And then when he was elected governor, I became a minister without portfolio, i.e. I was first lady. So I had to define what that meant to me. Sure. But it was very busy. Absolutely. But fortunately, I enjoy that. Um, so a lot of my interests and hobbies were minimized to a certain degree. And um, I didn't really mourn that at the time because I was, it was a very fulfilling time. Sure. To be able to help people, to be able to promote organizations and people that were doing good things and helping people in North Carolina. And having a platform to do that. Right. Because the, the First Lady has no power at all except she can convene a meeting. Um, she has a reduced size uh, public platform, but still a public platform. And people will re return her phone calls. So that's a good thing. There's something you can do with those three things. Remind our listeners when you were first lady. From 2001 until 2009, because Michael had two four year right. terms. And eight years is plenty. I would think so. What what was the best part of that? Oh well, the people the people I met and worked with were just wonderful. Um, it was an experience that was very personally enriching, and I hope I gave enough. Um, let's put it this way: I I squeezed all the good I could into what I was doing, so um, I don't think I left very much on the table. What was the worst part? I mean, obviously you're in the public eye. You're under a lot of scrutiny, both of you. I liked pretty much all of it. And whatever we had to sacrifice to get the things done that we wanted to do, like early college, which is still a very robust, robust program in North Carolina where kids can go take college courses in high school and they'll get a jump, get their first two years under their belt of college. Um, that's a very important program, and it is free. And um, the preschool program that gets kids ready for kindergarten and school, that was a very important. Um, so the things that we were able to do made a real difference, and that's very satisfying, and it was worth whatever sacrifices had to be made. You know, obviously you're a very strong person, very strong woman. I mean, you have to be tough to be in public life. And there's just no two ways about it. I mean, you have to let things roll. I know as a TV reporter for years, I would have to let things just go. People would say, have you seen what they're saying on Facebook about your story? No, I didn't look at it. Because well, it was just, sometimes you just have to keep You gotta be tough, rolling. but you should not be mean. No, no. Right? Right. Because mean doesn't get you anywhere. No. no. And my, my first boss always told me, you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. You absolutely that do. That is true. And um, so, you know, I don't pay much attention to people that are negative. Sure. Because there are plenty of people who are positive and doing positive, good, productive things. And they are the people that you need to support and amplify and multiply. Um, the positive. The positive and what they produce. That's so a great that's, way of looking at it. That's sort of the way I, I approached that first lady position because I didn't need a brand. You know? No, you Come weren't on. looking, for, you weren't a, an influencer, a TikToker. No, it was going to last like four years or eight years maybe. Right. So I don't need a, a Mary P. Easley brand. Forget about it. Because there are lots of people in organizations that are already have a brand, that are already doing That you work. are supporting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was my approach. So, so not talk about what though. did you do when you got out of that role? Like what, what were some of the steps you took? Because, you know, you had this big life and then you kind of went back to being a private citizen or you did go back to being a private citizen. So what, what did life look like after that? I still have a big life, right? I think so. It's that's defined what, differently, yes, but I still have a yeah. big life. And 
I learned something when Michael was elected Attorney General and we made the decision that we were going to move to Raleigh from Southport. I had a wonderful practice, private practice that I built myself. It was like having another child. Yeah, and then to walk away from that. Right. So that required um, me to rethink some things. And that required me to, to think about don't define yourself by your occupation or your profession. That's a great piece of advice. You are more than that. Great piece of advice. I learned that then, and it was a difficult lesson. It was very hard. Yeah. No, so I'd I been through it one time, and I knew what was entailed. So the second time, I knew that these jobs, you know, the day after the inauguration, People aren't going to return your phone calls other than your friends. Right. So it, so everything changes. That's right. So keep your friends and go into it realizing that it won't last forever. And that's fine. That's exactly the way it should be. Um, one of the things that a lot of people have talked about in this podcast so far is that life isn't linear. It goes kind of down rabbit holes and down different paths. And, you know, one day you're first lady, the next day you're moving on to something else. Um, what this podcast really focuses on is transformation for women. And a lot of women at a certain point in life feel stuck. They feel like they're not relevant anymore, like nobody's listening, uh, maybe even invisible. What advice do you give to women about reinvention and transformation and, and to keep going and finding the thing that gives them joy and passion? Don't think about it too hard. I really believe yeah, that. That it will what'll happen, it'll come to you with the positivity. Think more in terms of being exposed to different ideas, different experiences, and some you're gonna like and some you're not gonna be so keen on. But at some point, if you're persistent, you're gonna find some of you want to explore a little more. And sometimes those little unexpected roads lead to something really interesting that could be your next next engagement right I think about that as the rabbit hole you know you mm. think well why am I going down this detour and then maybe something's at the bottom of that rabbit hole that you need to find you know my mother had a term in Greek now she was born in the United States but she was bilingual I can't remember the Greek word for it right now but it has to do with keep turning the soil with your spade I like that keep turning it's a great visual that's right and uh, don't focus so much on the fact that you're digging a darn hole or whatever you're doing. Just turn it. Turn it and see what Just happens. Just keep going. Right. Yeah. You may find something that interests you that will end up surprising you. So what does life look like for you now? We understand, obviously, grandmother. Uh, you just told me off mic that you're really into exercise, which I am too. So we share that. I'm a hot yoga person and a runner. Um, what, are you, what else are you filling your life with right now? Well, I'm 73 years old now, and I feel better probably than I did when I was 60. And so my fitness and what I put into my body matter to me. So garbage in, garbage out right. in terms of what right. you eat. And uh, I'm not uh, militant about it, but I'm conscious of it. Sure, sure. I eat plenty, but I'm careful about what I eat. Yeah. And I love to exercise. That was a surprise. Oh, okay. Absolutely. A you surprise. didn't know. <laughs> no, I'm not particularly athletic. And then you started, you said you've been doing dance classes, which is so fun. Yep. Four days a week I do dance and the other two I do uh, light weights and balance and movement. So it's a slightly different from yoga. Yeah. Balance is so important. Mm -hmm. So that's been great. Now, then I had plenty of hobbies because my, my family and even Michael's family was into creating things. You know, my husband is a fantastic woodworker who makes I do know incredible that. furniture yeah. and still does that. Um, I had hobbies that I had to put to the side. And so re-exploring some of those lead me to new ones. And so during the pandemic, I taught myself how to play the ukulele. Um, yes, you sent me a picture of that. That's right. I uh, taught myself how to do that, and that really, believe it or not, it's a serious instrument. It's oh, I'm toy. sure. <laughs> I, all instruments are serious. My husband's a musician, so I'm in awe. I don't play anything, but so I'm in awe of it. That's just great. I like to reverse engineer recipes or food that we eat, 
to figure out how it's made. You know, some of it just has to do with research. Sometimes you have to look at old cookbooks. And it's funny, I, when I inherited a lot of my mom's cookbooks, and looking through them, she was doing the same thing like 50 years ago. So I don't know, maybe it was an inherited trait. Well, you have to watch Lessons in Chemistry then because that will, you will, it's delightful. Yes. But with the, with the recipes. <laughs> so that, I mean, there's endless things that I'm interested in and do. Yeah. Another thing that keeps coming up in this podcast is the word curiosity. So I think that if you are a curious person, which you obviously are, and I am as well, I see and come in contact with so many things and people that I go, oh, wow, I want to learn more about that. I'm interested in that. You know, um, how can I be connected to that? And I think if you have that curiosity, you're always going to find things that you enjoy, that you want to do. And the, well, the good news is because there is YouTube and other online resources, you can learn how to do, do anything. anything. Yeah. Whereas when, you know, 25, 30 years ago, I had to have books. You know, I have a you huge library yeah. of instructional books on how to digitize an embroidery pattern, how to wow. do all kinds of things. Wow. You name it. You know, what's I'm into your, it. What's on your bucket list? I don't know. Skydiving? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not going to know until I keep turning, turning that the soil. earth. Turning yeah. the soil. Yeah. No, I, I mean... Uh, a lot of people answer that question with travel because I think everybody loves to travel. But um, yeah, it's an interesting thing to consider because when the world is wide open to you at this point, you know, there's so many options, right, of things that you could possibly do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exciting. Amanda, I came from a family. My father, now who does this? My father actually ground his own mirrors to make his own telescope. Oh, wow. So... <laughs> I, I grew up looking at the solar system through this huge telescope he had in the back that he'd bring out in the backyard. So, yeah, we, we make things. <laughs> so just to wrap it up, how would you define this chapter of your life? So much fun. It's just fun. And having lived 44 years with a wonderful man, it's sweeter every day and more meaningful every day and um all the challenge the fun and the challenges and the experience i'm starting to tear up that we have shared you know every single day is is great you know well i can see obviously that you have a lot in common and knowing him for as many years as i did i can definitely see why he would be absolutely over over the moon with you. So, <laughs> oh, I don't know. He's a Not lucky, always. He, well, no, no, but he's a lucky guy to have somebody with your energy and your passion and your excitement for life because I think that's that that helps, you know, bring joy to a relationship. So, Mary, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today and your passion. And I think our listeners will absolutely um, find you and your life and your journey fascinating. So thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be with you, Amanda. Appreciate it.